Leaders from across the Gulf region have signed a declaration calling for solidarity and stability at a summit aimed at resolving the three-year dispute with Qatar. Representatives from Gulf countries, including the Emir of Qatar, have gathered in the city of Alula. It follows a move by Saudi Arabia to open its air, sea and land borders to Qatar in what's seen as a big step towards resolving an illegal blockade of the country. Delegations from Oman, Bahrain, the United Arab Emirates, Kuwait and Egypt are also attending. Earlier, Qatar's Emir, Sheikh Tamim bin Hamad Al Thani, was greeted by the Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman with an embrace. It marked one of the most important moments in relations between the Gulf countries in recent years. Our bloc has been built on the basis of our shared roots and common traditions with the aim of serving the interests of our respective people. Therefore, we should all work together towards achieving the goals on the basis of which this bloc was formed. OK, for more on this, let's talk now to our news correspondent, my colleague Al Jazeera's Jamal El Shayel. Jamal, who's been driving this? Well, over the past three years, the consistent uh, uh, push to resolve this has come out of Kuwait City. There were initially mixed messages coming from Washington. However, in the uh, past six to 12 months, there seemed to be more of a push from uh, the uh, Trump administration to resolve the crisis, which many people pointed um, towards uh, Trump's policies for actually being behind the divisions in the first place. The recent, um, let's say, uh, efforts that managed to get this over the finish line, so to speak, uh, did come following the visit of senior White House advisor and son-in-law law of Donald Trump, Jared Kushner, when he came to Riyadh and Doha, met with both uh, the Emir of Qatar, Sheikh Tamim bin Hamad Thani, and the essential de facto ruler of Saudi Arabia, uh, Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman. And that's when we saw a lot more movements. We saw the statements coming from Kuwait's foreign minister, uh, as well as, obviously, uh, this uh, uh, the lifting of the uh, air, land and sea blockade by at least Saudi in the past 24 hours. So that's essentially been the main uh, pushes behind it. But not lost on this, like I say, is the of both Kuwait and, to a certain extent, other countries. And that's why, for example, the summit that's taking place in Ola was actually dubbed the Sultan Qaboos and uh, uh, Sheikh Sabah Al Ahmed Al Sabah summit in uh, respect of the two late leaders of Oman and Kuwait, both of whom had a role in either reaching us to this, bringing us to this point, or at least uh, diffusing what was a very difficult situation. Will there be lots of loose ends that need to be tied up? And those loose ends may take several weeks, indeed, several months. That's a very nice way of putting it, loose ends. There are a lot of loose ends and there are a lot of differences. The question is, is do you actually have to tie them up? And that's what people need to uh, discuss, because countries do have differing opinions. They have different policies. At the crux of the division, Peter, wasn't the divisions or the different outlooks that these countries had in so much as it was not being able to either agree to disagree or not being able to find a mechanism where those differences could be settled. You had Qatar on the one hand, uh, which was uh, a lot more pluralistic in its approach to the Arab world, which was a lot more inclusive in the way in which it wanted to uh, not necessarily govern, but at least uh, engage with political forces in the Middle East and North Africa region. And then you had the blockading countries, which saw that as an existential threat to their either autocratic or uh, kind of absolute monarchies. Um, and those divisions still remain, whether they will just agree to disagree, as I say, or whether, as you say, they will try and hash them out in something we'll see. But just very quickly, what's important to note here is that what's happened in Al-Ula is a declaration and not some sort of a comprehensive deal that has concessions and agreements within it. OK, we must leave it there for the moment. Uh, thanks very much, Jamal. Mohamed Val is on the Qatar-Saudi border with this update from there. There is some activity around me. You may not see it behind me. This is the border crossing. But around us, there is a lot of activity by the police security. However, nobody has crossed yet. We've been here since the morning. Nothing of that sort has happened. We have asked uh, security personnel here. They told us they are waiting for instructions, but they said technically the border is open. And we have seen them, you know, uh, into the, inside the booths behind me, um, dusting off uh, the desks and cameras and so on. So there is preparation going on, but there is no crossing yet. It's very crucial to see people crossing here because this is the physical aspect of this blockade on Qatar. This is the only 
land border that Qatar has with the outside world and it is linking it with Saudi Arabia. It is a lifeline for many people who have been uh, 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 dealing in business and so on between the two countries, also for families uh, across, the, 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 across the region. Uh, remember, the Gulf region is a very socially connected area with tribes on both sides of the border, with families here and there, and they have been separated. That, that disruption in the social fabric uh, has been very painful uh, uh, over the last three years and many people are waiting for that situation to end. So the expectation is that uh, as the days go by, like tomorrow after tomorrow, maybe in three days from now, this uh, border crossing will return to normal. Well, Sultan Barakat is director at the Center for Conflict and Humanitarian Studies at the Doha Institute for Graduate Studies. He says Donald Trump's involvement in the crisis both allowed it to start, but also forced through a breakthrough. It was clear, I think, from the beginning that uh, Mr. Trump got everything confused and his knowledge of, of the region at the time was very limited. And he made statements that he and his administration regretted later on. And, and they reversed it. Uh, re they reversed a lot of these issues. And this is one of the things that really forced the hand of the Saudis to accept the, uh, the condition. Or, in fact, uh, uh, the only response Qatar has, has given right from the beginning, that is, we're willing to talk, but we are not going to accept those 13 conditions. We're willing to talk, but without any preconditions that we, uh, we meet any of those uh, totally irrational uh, demands. And, in and as a result of it, of course, uh, uh, Qatar did not just uh, lay down and, and take the blockade. They've done a lot of effort to try and, and uh, work around the blockade. They found alternative routes to connect to the world, to get supplies and so on. But most importantly, I think, they stuck to the law. And they pursued this with a great deal of, uh, of dignity and recognition of the fact that states are made by what the international law makes, makes of them and to what degree they respect that international law. So by the end of 2020, there were at least four or five cases that Qatar has won against the blockading countries, all very important uh, landmark cases to do with human rights, uh, World Trade Organization, uh, aviation uh, case. All of this would have naturally uh, ended the blockade had we just continued with this, because the, the, the rest of the world recognized that what uh, these blockading countries were doing was absolutely illegal.